On October the 1st, a new law will take effect in Louisiana that will make it more difficult for medical professionals in the state to access and administer a potentially life-saving drug. That drug is commonly given to women experiencing postpartum hemorrhaging, a serious medical condition involving excessive blood loss after labor, a leading cause of maternal mortality worldwide. It's also commonly used to treat women experiencing an incomplete miscarriage, which happens when some fetal tissue remains in the uterus after a miscarriage has occurred. The drug I'm talking about is misoprostol, which is also used uh, along with the drug mifepristone for medication abortion. In about a week, Louisiana will add both drugs to its list of scheduled for controlled dangerous substances, the first state to take this sort of action against abortion pills. And in doing so, the state will inevitably deny or delay necessary treatment for women who are experiencing various medical emergencies. Under Louisiana's law, women who take these drugs cannot be prosecuted, but anyone who helps them obtain it without a valid reason or prescription can face up to five years in prison and a fine of up to $5,000. It will also force hospitals and clinics to comply with unnecessary new rules and regulations regarding the storage and dispensation of both drugs. Like other Schedule IV substances, they will soon need to be locked away in secured areas or compartments, which means that misoprostol might not readily be available on a crash cart as a woman is bleeding out. It could literally be a matter of life and death which is why staff in some Louisiana, Louisiana hospitals are now performing timed drills using the new storage protocol for these crucial drugs so that they can practice all the new hoops that they're going to have to jump through to get the drugs they need in emergencies. But for some doctors and pharmacists, complying with these new regulations might be costly or the legal risks might be too great. And that's exactly the point. Anti-abortion legislators want to make it as prohibitive and frustrating as possible to comply with these regulations, so they choke off access to these pills entirely, just, how the, just like how they choked off access to abortion care by forcing abortion clinics to comply with numerous unnecessary regulations until it became so burdensome that many clinics were simply forced to close, which is why many parts of the country are considered maternal health care deserts today. And it's all because these lawmakers refuse to acknowledge that abortion is health care. Anti-abortion laws are actually making it more dangerous for women across the country. And that's been true from the moment that the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. This week, ProPublica reminded us of that fact with its report about two Georgia women who died because the state's strict abortion ban resulted in delayed care. One of those women who died was Amber Thurman. In the summer of 2022, she found out she was pregnant. She already had a son whom she was raising on her own. She had plans to enroll in nursing school, so she didn't think it was the right time to have more children. But Georgia's ban had just gone into effect, so she scheduled a surgical abortion in North Carolina. On the way there, Thurman and her friend got stuck in traffic and missed the appointment. They couldn't reschedule another one because the clinic was inundated with other per patients who, like Thurman, were coming in from states where abortion had just been banned. But the clinic offered Thurman abortion pills that she could take at home. They told her to monitor herself and to go to the emergency room if complications arose. Days after taking the pills, she continued to experience pain and heavy bleeding. The clinic in North Carolina told ProPublica that if Thurman had followed up with them and presented her symptoms, the protocol would have been to perform a DNC, a dilation and curatage. It's a minor surgical procedure that involves using a spoon-shaped instrument to scrape out tissue from the uterus. A DNC is also commonly used as a method of surgical abortion, and thus, under Georgia's law, it was simply illegal. On the night of August 18th, 2022, Thurman vomited blood and passed out at home. Her boyfriend called 911. An ambulance came and took her to the hospital. Medical experts who reviewed her record said it should have been apparent to doctors early on that she was in danger and a DNC would have been the proper course of action. But under Georgia's abortion ban, that could only be performed to save the life of a patient. It took 20 hours for do doctors to finally decide to perform the procedure, even as Thurman's health worsened and she developed sepsis. And by then, it was too late to save her life. An official review of her case by a committee that included doctors and other medical experts concluded that Sherman should not have died. But Georgia's strict abortion ban created unnecessary barriers that prevented her from receiving the care she needed 
when she needed it. Abortion is a human rights issue. The alternative to safe legal abortion is not simply the denial of freedom and bodily autonomy for women. It is forced birth, which is precisely the dystopian vision of the anti-abortion movement that is playing out right now in America. But abortion is also health care. In every sense of the word, it is health care because women often need it to stay healthy and to stay alive. And it is health care because abortion is a set of very specific medications and procedures that are used to end pregnancies and to also preserve women's lives and health in all other kinds of circumstances. Dilation and curatage, DNC, is used to clear out the uterus. It is used for elective abortions. It's also used for emergency abortions. It's also used for incomplete miscarriages. And it's also used for postpartum emergencies. It's used to save women's lives. I'm joined by Dr. Joya Creer Perry, founder and president of the National Birth Equity Collaborative. She also serves as the principal health equity cipher and sits on the board of trustees at the Black Mamas Matter Alliance. Uh, Dr. Creer Perry, good to see you. Thank you for joining us uh, this morning. Yesterday, Kamala Harris had a campaign event in Georgia, which was focused on reproductive rights, and she mentioned Amber Thurman's story. Let's listen together. Amber's mother, Shanette, told me that the word preventable is over and over again in her head when she learned about how her child died. The word preventable. She cannot, she can't stop thinking about the word that they spoke to her. It was preventable. There is a word preventable and there is another word, predictable. And the reality is for every story we hear of the suffering under Trump abortion bans, there are so many other stories we're not hearing. But where suffering is happening every day in our country. She also said that this is, quote, a health care crisis. As ProPublica noted, the Georgia State Committee that reviews pregnancy-related deaths like Thurman's operates with a two-year lag, which is why we're only hearing about uh, Thurman's case now. So the reality of the post-Dobbs landscape is likely worse than we currently know it is. Perfect. Yes, and thank you, Ali, for having me on. You know, the, po- the point is that elective abortion is um, when a person has a personal body autonomy or the ability to make decisions for themselves. And what we see across the United States is that governments are deciding that they should make decisions for women and the people who love them. So the, the decision to make a pill or a medication that we use commonly for miscarriage, as you mentioned, just think about the way that you had to think use those words. You were a person who uses words for a living. So you spent so much time trying to decipher between the word abortion and taking parts out. None of that is necessary if we could agree that any, any human being has the ability to make decisions for themselves and they are fully human. And so they shouldn't have anyone saying that you can't have an elective abortion. And that's what this conversation is about. Who has the ability to control their own bodies? The discussion we were having very specifically about these abortion drugs is that in, in they're, they sometimes have multiple purposes. Right. So mm-hmm. they they, they they are used yeah. on a crash cart. Uh, and so now it, it may not sound unreasonable to people that they should be stored a certain way and things have to happen. They're restricted drugs. That, that, that's that's a different okay. discussion. But if you actually might need them to save someone's life, which we have seen examples of women who die or come very close to death or lose their reproductive organs because they can't get the treatment they need, you're basically having the net same effect as banning abortion. And and I would say having them on a crash cart is actually death causing, truthfully. They are pills. So how we even discovered that the first pill um, works for abortion is that it was over, it was used in Brazil and people then um, were giving it to patients across the world uh, to, to, to have for a termination. So we're taking some that was used, it's, it's a GI medicine, it's used for um, ulcers, it's used, so it's a common medication and we're saying now it has to be put in a crash cart. So you're taking something that should be readily available to ensure people don't die and you're putting it inside of a crash cart. Does that make sense, I hope? Yeah, no, so I definitely. So you're creating a barrier that, yeah. It yeah. seems like there's still a disconnect in terms of understanding um, why abortion is health care. A woman showed her story, uh, shared her story on uh, this show recently who was dangerously delayed in getting treatment for a ruptured placenta after she gave birth to a healthy baby because the procedure to remove the placental tissue uh, that was causing her to bleed is a DNC. Uh, again, it's exactly. used across <laughs> women's health care. 
I, I don't I don't get okay. uh, I don't get what why so, uh, Alex, what's the issue here? So, so that's what I'm saying. So, so when you were using you, you did a beautiful opening and you've spent so much time on all those words and all those words mean the same thing. A DNC is an abortion. So when you can weapon, it's just like weaponizing the word socialism. I once did a town hall with the head of health care for the state of Louisiana and he said that Obamacare was socialism. And I said to him, well, you do you think LSU football is socialism? We take words that just mean yeah. the, the government investing in public good. So we make take the word DNC, which means abortion, and then we, we make it mean body parts and babies. And that's just not what it means. It's not a medical definition. I, mean, uh, I, don't, I don't have a better way to explain it for people to, are not interested in the truth. Um, yeah. So they purposely lie to us. And if you are a physician or, or a medical professional and you are participating in the conversation that there is something that's not um, that may, that um, microprestone and microprex are should be behind inside of a crash cart, then you are being intellectually dishonest. You did not attend a medical school and pass any kind of boards that I know of. The the way Louisiana descri describes these controlled substances, which is what they're calling these drugs now, um, that there would be some potential for dependency. I mean, the, the reason, look, it's debatable, and you, you medical people need to debate why certain drugs are classified as restricted or not. Often addiction, dependency, or remarkable dangers. These drugs don't fall into any of those categories. No, they don't. They are really, I mean, our governor is Catholic. I, I'm Cabathist, right? So I understand. I mean, I've been both Catholic and Baptist. There was a large belief within some parts of the Catholic community, not all, there are Catholics for choice, um, but there is a large belief that we must ensure that life at all costs. And they believe life begins at conception. So you hear all this word terminology about preconception choice and preconceptional, like when we use the word conception, we are saying that the only purpose of a uterus is to conceive. I mean, uteruses are also there. People have babies. People live without ever having children. I mean, we're not here just to procreate. So that entire language, that's where the wording and how we use words actually really, really matters.